Good morning. Welcome to Parkview Church of the Nazarene online. Thank you for joining us. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. And we have something special for you later on in the service to honor you. I have to tell you, I brought my kids with me this morning um, because it's Mother's Day and I wanted them with me. I've had church without my kids for the last eight weeks, and it's been hard. It's been hard on all of us, and I'm thankful to have them here this morning with me. I'm thankful to have you joining us this morning and worshiping with us today. I wanted to give you an update. Last week we told you about, we've been telling you about our mission, COVID-19, where we are raising money to help support Target Dayton and also our Indian Reservation in Arizona. We've almost met that goal. Thank you so much for that. Please continue to give. Will you pray with me this morning? Jesus, we are so thankful for your love and the way that you have blessed us and taken care of us and carried us through this just unusual time that we find ourselves in. We thank you for your peace. We thank you for this church and for Pastor JK and the way that you have been speaking through him to us. Thank you for all the moms. Thank you for my mom, my grandmother, and all the women, my aunts, who have just poured into my life. And I just pray that you would bless them today. Lord God, we just want to worship you. You are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our time and our efforts and our energy. And we just praise you and we thank you for today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. I know that we might not all be together this morning, but if you would just stand or lift a hand and worship with us. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my truth Till I met You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Now your mercy Now your mercy has saved my soul Your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew. The old man knew. Yeah. Jesus, when I met you, call my name. You call my name.
by this. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I
teaching me right from wrong and what is true. I love my mom. She chose life and gave me a home. When the years speed by and I'm gone, still I love my mom.
God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every Oh 
has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. Lord, we just thank you. thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. We thank you for being there when things are tough. We thank you for being there when kids don't get to graduate. We thank you for being there when families don't get to be together. We thank you for being there when churches don't get to meet. We thank you for being there when we can't visit each other in hospitals. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for that hope that you instill in us, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for sending your son and reminding us that there is life after death. That with you, there is so much more than what we experience on this earth, Lord. That with you, there is so much greater than what is right in front of us. For Lord, you are above us and you are watching out for us. And you are carrying us on your shoulders and lifting us up out of the dirt. Lord, we thank you. And I think it'd be a real shame if we didn't sing that third verse again. And then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me let's lift this up then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body Begin to breathe and out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus. 
Well, we thank the Lord for his goodness and his grace. It's wonderful to be in the presence of the Lord, whether you're at home or gathered here in the room with us today, and a few have gathered. We welcome you. Let's just lift our hearts to the Lord for a brief moment. Father, you have allowed us to come into your presence today, and what a blessing it's been. How fortunate we are to be a part of a church family. How fortunate we are to be a part of family. And on this day, I want to lift the mothers of the world to you. These are not easy times for mothers. So we lift them in Jesus' name for your help, your assistance, your encouragement, and your blessing. And may we all have a sense of uh, gratitude and express that more often than just on one day a year. Bless our families today. I was so encouraged by Joshua's prayer that you are with us, you are carrying us, you're uplifting us. We embrace that today with gratitude and thanksgiving. Now as we turn our attention to the word, open our minds. Our spirits have been opened now as we've worshiped in song, now as we worship in the word, open not only our spirit, but our mind and our will to receive your word for this day. We ask it in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen and amen. Well, I want to add my word of welcome to you on this uh, wonderful spring day. Whatever happened to spring? Seems like in the world today we go right from winter to summer, and then we go right from uh, summer to winter. I'd like to have some seasons again. Uh, may the Lord grant that desire at least one more time in my life. I'll be happy with that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm working on this theme of because he lives between now and Pentecost, the 50 days, uh, actually 40 days that Jesus appeared to his disciples and then Ten more days they waited in the upper room for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So this morning I want us to think together about uh, this idea of the risen Christ and what that means to us. You've heard me say this several times. I don't know how long I'll be here. They may throw me out any day, but um, as long as I'm here I'll be saying this, that our God is always up to something. And our God always has a plan. And our God seldom works alone. Those are three fundamental things I've come to believe about God. And they, they really shaped my philosophy of ministry and my understanding of the church. In, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, we read these words. And, and we see all three of these elements here. We see God being up to something. We see uh, God with a plan and we see God working with others. So here's 2 Corinthians. God gave us uh, the ministry of reconciliation, uh, namely that God, here's what God was up to, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. That's what God is mainly up to, reconciling the world back to himself. And he has committed to us, seldom works alone in his plan, he has committed to us the word or the message of reconciliation. In other words, God has, his plan is to give to us this message of reconciliation. He's not going to send angels. If I'd been God, I would have sent angels. That would have been more effective and uh, a lot easier to do than working with the likes of us. But God determined that uh, his plan is to commit to us this word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. That's uh, God seldom works alone. He's not making that appeal by himself. He's making that appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's the way God works. The plan of God, the activity of God, is to reconcile a lost world back to himself. The plan of God is to release that, that into the hands of his people. And he entrusts us with this great responsibility. 
I'm amazed at that. Now, he did send the Holy Spirit to help us, but I'm amazed that God chose to do it in this way. So this morning, I want us to think about the church. There, there are several things that happened immediately, and the first was that because Jesus lives, we have a prayer, and that's the prayer in John 17, that we would be kept. Because Jesus lives, uh, we have a promise, you will receive the Holy Spirit, and when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power so that you can be my witnesses. That's the promise. Uh, we have a people. We have the people of God, so constituted on the day of Pentecost when they all came together and the movement of God began in the world. And then, then God talks to us about his plan. And the plan is that the church would fulfill the mission of God. So I, I want us to read from Acts chapter 13 this morning. Uh, we're now about, oh, anywhere from 15 to 20 years away from the ascension of Jesus. Now, during this time, uh, the church has been dispersed. Persecution rose rather quickly in the city of Jerusalem, so the church was sent out, not, not feeling like they were on a mission, but dispersed because of persecution. So they're, they're moving here and there, and they're going to different places, uh, Philip has preached to an Ethiopian eunuch. Peter has already preached to the household of Cornelius, and Gentiles are being saved. And when that happened, the church was concerned about that. It's a terrible thing to get the wrong kind of person saved, so they had to have councils and to discuss that. During this time, uh, Saul uh, has been persecuting the church and has been converted and has now gone to Arabia and then back to Tarsus for some reflective time and to, to regroup himself for the ministry to which God has called him. The Bible says uh, in Acts chapter uh, 12 that they were preaching, the people from Jerusalem were preaching in Antioch, but they were preaching the word to the Jews only. It's pretty exclusive. Um, now, as I said, we're... 15 years after the ascension of Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when you get impatient with your, your friends in your local church, grant them a little grace. It took the early church a long time to work through some issues, uh, trying to overcome some traditions and some things they'd been taught as children. The fact that we have a pure heart does not mean that we have a mature character. So give people a little space. Be patient with them as they try to work through this. So they're preaching only to the Jews, and Barnabas comes, and Barnabas starts preaching to the Gentiles, and then he goes and gets Saul and brings Saul back. So here we are at this time. So now there were at Antioch, and Antioch was quite a large church. It wasn't a little house church. Now there were at Antioch, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, uh, let's see, there was uh, Barnabas, that's the Barnabas we read about in Acts chapter 4, who sold some land and gave it to help others. So he was evidently a man of some means, but now has become an evangelist. Maybe he was in the upper room, we, we really don't know. So we have Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, who'd been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Uh, quite an eclectic group. In fact, this was a multicultural group, the first multicultural expression in the history of the Christian church, right here in Antioch, which became the center uh, and, and the home base of Christian missions. So while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them, then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went. So, so here you have the church sending, but these who are sent understood that it was the Holy Spirit who was sending through the church. That's God working through his people. So, so they went. So the church is uh, drawing near, ministering to the Lord. Before a church can go anywhere, a church has to come near to the heart of God. 
no other way to do it. You, you can't develop strategies and programs. And one of my, uh, one of my pet peeves in the, in the church world today, Church of the Nazarene and nearly every other group I know about, is we spend all of our time talking about strategies and plans and all the kinds of things we need to do, and we're not giving very much attention to the development of the spiritual life of, of clergy and of lay people. And we, we kind of want to skim over the surface of all of this, and that's why the church is in such disarray in the United States and in steep decline in so many places. We, I like what E.M. Bounds said 100 years ago, uh, the church is looking for better methods and God is looking for better people or better men. He's looking for people. We're looking for solutions and God is looking for people because people are God's solutions. The church is God's solution to the problem in the world. He wants to work through the church. So here's the church uh, ministering to the Lord. Most commentators agree that that phrase ministering could be reduced to this, that the church was in worship. Like, like we are today. Now they were together. Most scholars believe that it was mainly a staff meeting. Uh, the men that I mentioned earlier, they were all together, maybe a few others. I don't think it hurts us to think that maybe the whole church was there. The church gathered, whether it's a small group or a large group, the church is gathered and they're worshiping in spirit. Early church worship consisted of... Uh, among other things, a time of singing. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5 that we should be speaking to one another in hymns and psalms and spiritual songs, always making melody in our hearts to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So they were singing the psalms. The children of Israel, when they made those journeys to Jerusalem for those special days, they sang the psalms. Uh, we need to put more of them to music. We have some but they sang the psalms, and God anoints his word. So there would have been singing. There would also have been a time of reading of the scripture, and then over time there developed the exposition of the scripture, the preaching aspect. It wasn't present immediately, but it developed over time. And those early church gatherings in, included a meal. You'd think it was the Church of the Nazarene and a potluck. I mean, they loved that sort of thing. They ate together in remembrance of Jesus' last supper with the disciples. Now, my wife would have called that the last dinner, but I call it the last supper. We have, I have supper at house, our house. She has dinner because I think if supper was good enough for Jesus, that's good enough for me too. But she, she likes to improve on it. So the last supper, they celebrated the last supper, and then they would celebrate the Eucharist or Holy Communion. Because Jesus had supper with his disciples, and then he took the cup, and then he took the bread. So it wasn't a part of this dining together. It was something after. And those were some of the main elements. There were other things that developed over time, but those were the main elements of worship. So they're, they're worshiping in spirit. There's some things that were true about that early church that must be true of any church that wants to draw near. And the fact is, the church has to pray. And, and we, do, we don't do a lot of praying. We do a lot of talk about praying. We know all the right things to say about prayer. And often when we get together to pray, we spend our time singing or testifying, and we really don't, don't pray. Um, we're, we're going to work on that. There, there should be designated seasons and times for prayer in the life of every church. Praying is a priority. It's not secondary. It's not let's do this and pray that God will bless us. It's let's pray and find out what God wants to do and then do what he wants to do. So we first pray. So they're, they're praying. They're waiting on the Lord. Now we use prayer in a lot, of, uh, a lot of strange ways. Jesus gave us a pattern to pray. Not, not that we have to use the words, but I think he intended for us to take the pattern. He said, when you pray, say, Our Father, who art or which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So he says to us, if you're going to pray, you start first of all in worship. I, I brought my, my cell phone with me today. I, I have a prayer list on my cell phone. And here, here's the way I begin 
uh, my, my times of prayer, uh, every day as I pray, a season of adoration. And here's, here's what I've written about God over the last several months. God is an incredible, ever-present love, unending, transforming grace, undeniable, unchanging truth unfailing presence, unlimited compassion and loving kindness, new every day. Ever-present Holy Spirit, unfailing forgiver of our sins, unsurpassed giver of new life, sanctifier of our lives, unfailing guide and teacher, healer and restorer, mender of broken hearts, eternal light for every day, peace in the middle of unrest, hope for every new day, calm in every new storm, courage in the face of every fear, consolation in every disappointment. And I confess that to, to, to the Father. I, I worship him in, in saying what I believe about him and what I feel about him. And in my time of confession, I not only confess my personal needs, but I further confess that he's my highest love. He's my greatest joy. He's my deepest need, my longing, my hope my strength for the day, my courage for challenges, my reason for living, the desire of my heart, peace in the storm, my rest in confusion. I, I, think, it's, I think it's so important for us to have a, a way of coming to the Father. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let me confess who you are and let me worship you for who you are, not for what you do, but for who you are. So they were praying, and I think they were praying in that way. Then, then Jesus said, you need to pray, thy, your, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, I know some people believe that you should tell God what you want, and if you have enough faith, he has to do it. Jesus said, when you pray, acknowledge who God is, and then say to the Father, Everything else I say after this, this is qualified by this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So whether that's what I'm going to ask you to do or what I want you to do, I'm going to, I'm going to express my desires, but I surrender it all right now. I don't think that's a lack of faith. I think that's an act of obedience and a statement of faith that the will of the Father is absolutely the best for all of us. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then you can ask him for, for your daily bread, your daily substance and sustenance. And then, then you can ask him to, to not lead you into a place of temptation. You can ask him to forgive your trespasses. These are all things that we need to confess. And then close our prayers with, Worship and adoration, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. They were, they were a praying church. When we learn to pray like that, we, we more closely align ourselves with the plan of God and the purposes of God and the heart of God. If all of our praying is telling God what to do, then what we're saying is, my will be done on earth and let it be done in heaven as well. That's not a good way to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's not to say we don't tell him what we want, what we need, but we surrender it all to him. So they were praying and then they were fasting. Fasting is something of a, of a lost art or practice in the church. I love those three things that Jesus uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, said he just assumed that every one of his followers were due. Uh, the first one, oddly, was when you give, which really seems strange to me that he'd start there. But when you give, here's how you ought to give. And when you pray, here's how you ought to pray. And when you fast, not if you fast, not if you give or if you pray, but when you do these things, what Jesus was doing was outlining his, outlining his kingdom on earth. And he's saying, these are practices of those who are part of my kingdom. So they were fasting. And then uh, the Bible tells us they were listening. It doesn't tell us that, but it insinuates that. Because the Holy Spirit spoke. And when the Spirit spoke, everything else was off the table. 
Everything else is off the table. I don't know. I, I believe that God still speaks. I believe God speaks to lay people as well as clergy. I think God wants to birth in the hearts of many of you of the Parkview family visions of and dreams and ideas for expanding the ministry of this church and reaching more effectively into our community and more perfectly representing Christ in the world in which we live. I think God wants to speak to some of you. You don't have to defer to the clergy to find the will of God. God can talk to us individually, corporately and individually. And when the Lord speaks to me, most often I like to, to get with some people and throw that idea out on the table because I don't understand perfectly all the time what God wants to do. And sometimes my own desires get mixed up with God's desires, so I need someone to help me work through that. But sometimes God says something to you that's so definitive and so clear, it wouldn't matter if the whole world thought it were crazy, you'd do it anyway, because you have that assurance that God speaks. Now, I've, I've never said this where it's being taped, so I run a big risk. I've heard an audible voice that I think was the voice of God one time in my life, just one time. And I was getting ready to play golf, Bob. Where'd Bob go? I was getting ready to play golf and was really looking forward to some time on the golf course. And it was a Monday morning and I got my clubs out and my shoes on. I couldn't find anybody to play with, so I thought I'd play by myself. So I'm on my way to the, the clubhouse and, and I hear someone say, Johnny, that, that's my name. That's what God calls me. Patty calls me that. So Johnny, and I stopped and and turned and, and looked, and there was nobody there. Uh, have you ever been in a, those of you who are parents, have you been in a, a shopping center sometime and, and you, your kids are grown and gone and someone says, Dad, Mom, and you stop and turn? <laughs> because that word just catches your attention. Well, that's, that's kind of what happened. So I didn't see anybody, so I, I went on and Johnny, and I turned again and stood there for a few moments. And the voice, whose ever voice it was, said, go to the hospital. Now, we only had one person in the hospital, so I assumed that's where I should go, and I drove to Midwest City Memorial Hospital and got out of the car. We only had one person there. I'd been to see her before, and I had no idea of why I was going on that Monday morning. I had met the lady in the room by the door and talked with her several times. I walked in the room, and this lady was weeping, the lady that was not a part of our church. And she said, Pastor, I've been praying that you would come today. And she gave her heart to the Lord that morning. I don't know what ever happened to her. She was not from the city where we live, but she was not there the next time I went back. But I thought, what if, what if I hadn't been listening? What if I'd ignored? How often do we ignore the nudges of the Holy Spirit? And how often do we as a church shut God out of our worship experiences? We have an agenda. We have things we have to get done. We're on a timetable. I'm not even going to finish this sermon today. I'm about to run out of time right now. But we're, we're, we're just pressed, and so we, we don't have time for God to interfere with what we're doing. We're doing God's business for crying out loud. Let us get the business done. Then you can talk to us. And so we rush on. And there were several times when I was pastoring in Olathe, Kansas College Church, when during a song or or at a particular time in the service, I sensed the, the Spirit of God moving. And I would step to the podium and ask our minister of music to lead the choir in that again, or let's sing that chorus again. I, I feel like God is moving. I don't know. Maybe he's not. Maybe it's just me. And most of the time when that happened, people would begin to come forward. And those services ended with me sitting on the 
steps of the platform, just watching God do what only God can do. Aren't we hungry for that sort of thing? I'm not talking about a, an emotional, I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about, aren't we hungry for a moving of the Spirit of God so that we are different when we walk out of the sanctuary than we were when we walked in the sanctuary? Even if we've been Christians for a long time, aren't we hungry for something like that? Now, this, is, this is the church worship, worshiping in spirit. Well, I'm not... I'm not going to try to, I'll pick up here next week. Praying, fasting, listening. God is up to something. You know, there's no reason in the world why I should be standing here today. I am way past the age. <laughs> when 99% of the churches in America would say, we don't want that old guy. I believe God is up to something. I, I don't know what he's up to. Um, a church that's, that's had its struggles in the past. It's wrestled with different kinds of issues and challenges. It's, that's who we are wondering, wishing, hoping. It's, it's all going to start here. It'll all start in true biblical worship. If we want to see what we think we want to see, and it will cost us a great deal. Not necessarily financially, it will cost us financially. But it will cost us more than that. It, it's costly to do the will of God. If you think this is about a free ride, you need to get on another train. <laughs> this is a costly way to live. The cross is, is no easy thing to take on, the cross life. Fasting, self-denial, we're going to have a sacred assembly here in a few weeks. And I'm going to ask you to fast from 6 in the morning until 6 at night. And then we're going to gather here at the church for six hours of uh, worship in song, worship in confession, worship in prayer, and then a 15-minute break. We'll do that until midnight. Well, couldn't we do that in less time than that? Well, the last time I did it, it was 24 hours. I knocked six hours off, so that's, that's a concession. Fasting and listening. The Quakers were on to something. Sitting, listening, listening, waiting for the Spirit of God to move. Waiting to respond, waiting to receive waiting to move. So what is, what is God up to in Dayton, Ohio? Well, for one thing, the main thing, he's up to reconciling the world to himself through Jesus Christ. That's what God is up to. And what kind of plan would he come up with? Well, he's already come up with the plan. <laughs> and we're all a part of the plan. We're integral and necessary to the plan. He doesn't, have an, he doesn't have an alternative plan. If we don't do it, it won't get done. I mean, if, if the people of God don't do it, it won't get done. It, that's just as simple. It doesn't mean any particular church, but the people of God, if we don't do it, it won't get done. And if we're going to, if we're going to get it done, we're going to have to draw close to him, close to him. So what does God have for you? I'm kind of puzzled about what he has for me, but what does he have for you? What, he wants, what does he want from you? What is your role? And some of you say, 
Well, Pastor, I'm retired. Well, get over that. So am I. That, that won't wash with me. So don't, don't even come and talk to me about that. Well, I have, there, there are mitigating circumstances, I know. But what is it God wants from you? God works in the context of who we are and where we are. He doesn't expect us to do something that we can't do. He may ask us to stretch ourselves, but whatever he asks us to do, he's already equipped us to do. So that's, that's just the truth. What does he have for you? And what does he have for us together? Well, next, next week I want to talk to you about the church and worshiping in action. Because worship is not mainly here. This is a refueling on a Sunday morning. Worship is out there every day. We'll talk about that next Sunday morning. Josh is going to come and he's going to sing a closing song. Kind of an invitational hymn. And there are a few people here in the sanctuary who, if they wanted to come and pray, they certainly could. But maybe in your home, the Lord would draw you close this morning. And you might even want to get on your knees before him today. And just think about worshiping in the spirit, praying and fasting. And then when you get all that you need to say said, don't forget to stop and listen because God may want to respond to your prayers. We're going to wait just a moment while Josh sings and then we'll close with prayer. God's up to something. I sure want to know what it is and I sure want to be a part of it, whatever it is. Father, we're trying to draw near. So many things that hinder us, we need to lay them aside. Teach us how to do that. Help us to learn together. We need you, not just a couple of days a week. We need you every hour and every tick of the clock. We need you. And I confess to you, Father, this morning that I'm available. I'm listening as best I can. Over these last couple of years, you've been taking a lot of things out of my life that complicated my hearing. And I thank you for that. So in Jesus' name, we together, those of us in this room and those of us in our homes, we together offer ourselves in worship to you, waiting, listening for your voice. And our commitment is we will be obedient. I pray this in 
Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Have a good week.